All right, so um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to today's uh, AHN Educational Nephrology Webinar. Um, today, we are lucky to have a very good presenter from Tanzania, uh, Dr. Francis uh, Frederick Furia, who is a consultant pediatrician and nephrologist uh, working in Tanzania. And uh, he'll be taking us through uh, the topic, an overview of pediatric acute kidney injury in Africa. So uh, before we, I, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Furia, my name is Dr. Gina Francis Makwabe, I'm consultant uh, physician and nephrologist from Tanzania. And I'm working with Africa Healthcare Network, uh, the chief medical director in Tanzania. So I would like to welcome you all. And um, before I in invite uh, Dr. Furia Francis, let me go through uh, his short bio. Dr. Francis is a consultant pediatric, pediatrician and nephrologist uh, working in Tanzania and has a master's of medicine in, me in pediatric. And also he was trained uh, for master's of science in nephrology. Uh, which was a sandwich between the uh, University of Dar es Salaam, CMC Verol, and uh, Bergen, Norway. He also has a fellowship in a forage from South Africa. Uh, he, Dr. Francis has also a certificate in pediatric rheumatology from UK. He's a, uh, he's a senior nephrologist. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a consultant nephrologist and senior lecturer at the Muhimbiri University of Health and Allied Sciences uh, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And he has established a pediatric nephrology practice at the Muhimbiri National Hospital, that, which is the biggest hospital in Tanzania. So I would like, uh, he, he also, uh, he's also a consultant nephrologist and pediatric rheumatologist working at the Aga Khan Hospital in Dar es Salaam. And therefore uh, he will take us through the overview of pediatric acute uh, kidney injury in Africa. So, uh, Dr. Francis, you are warmly welcome. Um, thank you, Dr. Makwabe. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity and for that kind introduction. I, my talk was uh, meant to be acute kidney injury in Africa, I mean, um, and uh, an overview. And um, uh, for some uh, specific reasons, I've uh, chosen to uh, focus my talk on Sub-Saharan Africa which also represent a big part of Africa. Um, sorry, I guess, uh, all right. So I, I work at Mumbili University and uh, on, the, on the top uh, image, you can see this is our university, uh, which is uh, based in Dar es Salaam. And on the lower part, you can see a uh, pediatric complex at Mumbai National Hospital. Uh, this is the center that I also work, and that's where we provide uh, pediatric nephrology services and other pediatric services. Um, it's the biggest, uh, it's the national referral uh, hospital in Tanzania, and it has close to 2,000 beds with a little more than 200 beds for pediatric uh, patients. And it is admitting different kinds of patients, including surgical, oncology, um, ophthalmology. So it's really a pediatric complex as far as patient's care is concerned. Um, well, before I go on, I would like to wish everybody a happy Africa Day. And if you all know that uh, we marked uh, Africa World Day, uh, on uh, two days ago. So it is befitting uh, to wish everybody a uh, happy Africa Day. So I guess it is an opportunity, a great opportunity to be talking to you on this uh, auspicious occasion while marking this uh, particular day. But it is also sad that I might be, I might be narrating about uh, what is happening in our uh, patients as far as care for these patients with acute kidney injury is concerned. Um, so before I start my talk, I would like to uh, make you, all of you, think about uh, what it means to have acute kidney injury in sub-Saharan Africa. So I would start my talk by just uh, giving you a scenario of, for you to think about a 19-month-old child who is presenting to your hospital, um, who is presenting with weight loss, generalized body swelling for three weeks and diarrhea. 
and who is weighing 0 0.2 with uh, weight for length lying in the Z score of negative two standard deviation, negative three standard deviation. And let's say you make a diagnosis of kwasha core and severe anemia and acute water diarrhea. And these are the labs. You can see the creatinine is 30 and the albumin is 13, BS is negative. Um, and you treat this child with ampiclostigendamycin for seven days and special diet and low small hour rice. And of course, this patient's diarrhea settles, edema subsides. And nine days, after nine days, there's urine out output, um, reduced urine output. You try furosemide, no improvement. And after 10 to 16 days, this child, this child is anuric. Creatine is move, uh, shoot from 85 to 256. Potassium with 4.7. And you are being called to see this child. You don't have PD catheter, you don't have PD fluid, and you don't have access for hemodialysis. What would you do for this particular case? So I'm giving this um, as a typical um, situations that faces most of the practitioners working in most of the sub-Saharan Africa, African countries. Um, so, um, in 2015, um, in Cape Town, um, it was March uh, 2015, uh, in the first African uh, hosted uh, World Congress of Nephrology, the statement uh, of acute kidney injury being a human right uh, issue was given and was uh, given by International Society of Nephrology. Uh, Professor Deuce Remuzi gave this and he was the sitting uh, ISN uh, president. And of course, with this statement, there was a launching of zero by 25 initiative, which was uh, aimed at having zero preventable death from AKI by 2025, which was a very, very ambitious uh, goal and call. Uh, this um, ISN zero by 25 uh, uh, statement was uh, preceded by global snapshot study, which was looking at the burden of acute kidney injury globally. And of course, this was, uh, cleverly done, it was organized by ISN. It was supposed to be done between, it was, it was done between October and December, 2014. And uh, each participating facility would choose three index days from which they pick patients and send the details to the uh, ISN uh, coordinating team. And 72 countries, and ideally what these teams were supposed to send were these, cases of acute kidney injury. 72 countries participated and we did participate from Mumbai National Hospital. And I do believe that other centers did participate. And in this snapshot, um, a little bit over 3,600 adult cases were uh, presented and only 354 children were reported. And most cases were coming from lower, uh, and um, lower and low middle income countries, which was 45%. And the causes of acute kidney injury were mainly hypotension and dehydration. Of course, sepsis, pregnant related acute kidney injury and animal envenomation were, were, was also reported in lower and um, low middle income countries. So at least this is giving you some picture to see how children are underrepresented. Look at this global, uh, global snapshot the number of cases that were reported for uh, adult patients as uh, compared to number of patients that were re reported for pediatric patients. So in this particular statement, which is zero by 25, there were five key elements, which was, um, the first one was uh, early uh, detection, recognition, response, renal support, as well as re re rehabilitation. And these were the elements that were identified as the key elements that will be used to meet uh, this bold, very, very bold uh, target. And of course, these countries were classified into three levels. And if you look at the law at the level three, these are the countries that are coming from the really, really low, low income countries. And these are the countries that do not have support, access to services, and no established dialysis services 
And it was noted that these are the countries that might need a lot of interventions from IS, from zero by 25 teams and anywhere else that they could access these resources. So um, when we talk about acute kidney injury, it's, it's nothing but just an ab abrupt reduction in the kidney functions. And of course it happens within days to weeks might be characterized by retention of urea and other nitrogenized uh, waste. And of course, there's major dysregulation of extracellular volume and electrolytes. And it can be defined, and it is usually defined in most cases by serum creatinine, as well as uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate, as well as the urine output. Um, and if you look at the... Uh, uh, classification. Of course, they, if, if you look at the definition of acute kidney injury, it, it has seen a lot of uh, evolution over the years. The first criteria that was put forth was in 2004, which was acute kidney injury network. And eventually in 2007, there was RIFO criteria. And in 2012, I believe there was KIDIGO criteria, KIDIGO criteria. And here we are comparing two uh, criteria that are being used, UFP RIFO as well as uh, 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 KIDIGO criteria. And they are both classifying these patients with acute kidney injury based on the risk, injury, failure, and loss, as well as stage one, stage two, and stage three. So this is the kind of how we define these patients with uh, acute kidney injury. And it means that you need to get your serum creatinine. At the same time, you also need to get your urine output. And I'm just trying to highlight how difficult it is to monitor these targets, given the challenges that we have in the health system and health services in most of these countries and the shortage of human resources. So when you're talking about monitoring of urine output as well as doing serum creatinine and being able to diagnose acute kidney injury, we could all imagine how difficult and challenging it might be. So when we are defining this uh, acute kidney injury, despite the fact that we might have uh, difficulties in having all these uh, facilities and support. Of course, the, the criteria that we are using to define acute kidney injury are also quite difficult because if you want to get, if you want to know there's a, a, a rise in serum creatine, you also need to know the baseline, which most of the time might not be known. These are the patients that are coming for the first time. Uh, to the facility. Of course, we also need to appreciate that serum creatine is a very, very uh, delayed and imprecise test that can tell you. Sometimes you might have acute kidney injury, but then you, you might have um, a lag time in raising of serum creatine. And of course, if you are dialyzing your patient, this might be removed by dialysis. Okay, And there are other factors that might uh, uh, reflect on the uh, serum creatine, including age, gender, muscle mass, hydration status. So if you have a child who's severely wasted, the serum creatine might be quite low. And by being low, it does not mean that this patient has normal or it does not have acute kidney injury. And we are also using urine output as a defining um, index for acute kidney injury. But we, we know in small kids and in children and with limited uh, human resource, how difficult it will be to monitor uh, urine output. And of course, so these are the factors that you're also looking at. But the other important factor that we all need to think about is the compromised unif uniformity of in defining a kidney injury. If you're using P -Rive, you are using PRI for a Kane and Kaidego, you might not be able to get uniformly the same kind of um, uh, uh, patients with acute kidney injury. So, so uh, the Kaidego criteria, which is my favorite, by the way, re is recommended based on the fact that it combines the two, rifle and P rifle and akin together. And then, and you can easily um, define acute kidney injury by just looking at the serum creatine when it is raised uh, by 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter, which is equivalent to 26.5 micromole per liter within 48 hours. Or if it is increased by to one, more than 1.5 times baseline within seven days. And of course, if you have urine out, which is less than 0 0.5 mil per kilogram per hour for six hours. So one of the challenges, I, as I said before, this is a nice study which was done by um, Sutherland et al. And it, it was published in CGSN. They are just comparing the diagnosis of acute kidney injury in children when you're using these three uh, criteria. And if you look at the P rifle, so 1,700, almost uh, 1,700, more than 1,700 patients were diagnosed by P rifle alone as having acute kidney injury. And KDGO, uh, 
clinical criteria diagnosed six patients alone. So if they were not picked by the other criteria, but just KDEGO picked these patients to have acute kidney injury. But of course, there's zero patients that was picked by Akin, but the uh, 5,400 patients were picked by all three criteria as having acute kidney injury. So what does this mean? It means that when we are using this criteria, there's a chance that you might be missing acute kidney injury if you're using one, uh, one criteria as opposed to the other one. Of course, this is another challenge which is also uh, posed to the healthcare provider when they are choosing uh, which criteria to use. So, um, what are the causes of acute kidney injury in children? Of course, these causes can be classified based on different uh, uh, criteria. You could use anatomical classification, you could use clinical setting or circumstances. Sometimes they could also be classified based on the urine output. And by this, we mean that um, uh, the other important classification that can also come is which is based on the anatomical, is it renal disease, something that is compromising the blood, uh, the, the perfusion of the kidney, or is it something that is happening within the kidney, which is causing structural damage to the renal parenchyma, or it could be something that is happening beyond the kidney, which is what we call post-renal diseases, which might form, might take the form of obstruct, obstruction. And this could be several uh, um, anatomic obstruction that might compromise the functions of the kidney. But as I said, again, you could also classify these causes based on community acquired acute kidney injury, when you, which in most cases, you have a single predominant insult. Uh, and uh, most of the time, these are reversible. But sometimes you could have hospital acquired co causes. And these are usually caused by extensive multi-organ failure and might be difficult. And these are usually having a very uh, severe and poor prognosis. So, so, so let's look at the burden of acute kinesia in sub-Saharan Africa. I, I specifically chose to focus on sub-Saharan Africa because of the, uh, this is the region that is usually having the least uh, support and uh, uh, poorly developed services when it comes to uh, management of acute kidney injury. And of course, it is a huge uh, population block of 1.1 billion people. And this is also the region that is mostly affected by HIV AIDS, affected by malaria, with a very, very high underfight mortality rate, with a very high neonatal mortality rate, very high maternal mortality rate. So this is the region which is also mud by limited resources in terms of human resources as well as equipment. And you could see this region, uh, such a huge block. So um, if you're talking about the burden, of course, you will be interested to know what are these things that are causing a kidney injury. So if you look at the sub-Saharan Africa, these causes, they will be uh, primarily the infection, infectious causes. This is a tropical. Most of these areas are in tropical areas and infections will be quite common. So you have parasitic, uh, which in malaria being the predominant one, but you also have viral, bacterial and other fungal infections, which might not be uh, well documented. Uh, you also have glomerular diseases, which are also common in this particular uh, area, particularly post-infectious glomerulonephritis, which is quite uh, following infectious causes. But you also have nephrotoxicity. These nephrotoxicities could be use of herbal medications, could be drugs, could be animal bite, could be snake bites, and other things that can cause that. But you also have intravascular volume depletion. Again, there's an overlap between these causes, because when we talk about intravascular volume depletion, we are also referring to, 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 to some of the other causes that might be caused by infections. But by and large, despite the fact that this place is uh, uh, marred by uh, mostly community-acquired acute kidney injury, but we are also seeing hospital-acquired uh, causes. Of course, uh, there's, uh, we are seeing um, an advancement in the services that are being offered. We are also going into uh, more fancy surgeries. We have intensive care settings and all these things. So these are also contributing to, the, to this burden of acute kidney injury. So in this uh, interesting study that was um, reviewed, actually,
represented by Professor Saralaika Daivi. And if you look at the causes of acute kidney injury by region, you will see that what is common across the region is the malaria, except for the North, North Africa, which is basically not part of Sub-Saharan Africa. But if you look at the Sub-Saharan Africa, you will see that malaria featuring in most of the cases, as well as infections and um, all these other causes. And so this is an interesting picture that people can look at so that they can know what kind of causes of acute kidney injury are we dealing with. So I wanted to look for you to look at this particular picture. This is an agent distribution of hospital death in Tanzania. Uh, between 2006 and 2015. If you look at the causes of death, and if you look at the percentage uh, of total death, you will see that children are, contributed, are contributing to a big chunk of this death. If you're looking at the children from zero to 19 years, they contribute the big, uh, the big part of this mortality if you compare with the other age, age structure. And if you look at this, um, if you look at the cumulative, cumulative proportion of death by the cause, your area is ranked at the first one. So it shows malaria is the common, is the, is, the, is the leading cause of mortality. And this is the picture that is seen in Tanzania because this study was published from Tanzania. But looking at the burden and the causes of kidney injury that was uh, presented by Nika et al. You will see that uh, malaria will be contributing to significant acute kidney injury and mortality in this region. Um, so this is an interesting study that was done in, in, in Nigeria, and uh, it is just showing us that children with severe malaria, almost 59% of children with severe malaria had acute kidney injury. And of course, close close to 20% of those had severe form of acute kidney injury. So this is just underpinning the burden of uh, malaria causing acute kidney injury in children. And I guess people should also look at this as one of the, when we are saying that malaria is one of the leading cause of, of, of mortality, we, we might also um, infer to the fact that acute kidney injury might be one of the contributing factor to these mortality that are happening with for patients with malaria. This is another uh, study that was done in Cameroon, and this is Dula Dula uh, Dula uh, Hospital. And they are just looking. If you're looking at the causes of acute kidney injury, you will see that. Uh, and this study was looking at the epidemiolo epidemiology of uh, renal disease in patients that presented to the uh, to this particular hospital. And you will see that most of the patients had acute kidney injury, and this is to the tune of more than 85 percent of the patients. And if you look at the causes, the commonest causes, of course, sepsis was ranked as the first one, but severe malaria is also contributing significantly to this, to this uh, burden of acute kidney injury. Why is it malaria causing all these things? So we should also know that there are several mechanisms that are bringing about acute kidney injury when we are looking at uh, acute kidney injury. So it could be mechanical because this, when, when red blood cells are parasitized by malaria, they could uh, come together and form rosettes and these rosettes will cause peripheral pooling of blood and compromise the blood supply. And that will cause tissue hypoxia as well as uh, uh, acute, uh, acute tubular necrosis because there will be impaired perfusion. But there is immunological mechanism when you are infected with malaria. Of course, these are antigens, so there will be antigen antibody reaction, and these complexes could be deposited in the kidney, and they will also cause glomerulonephritis as another mechanism that can bring about um, acute kidney injury. But without forgetting that uh, severe malaria is a metabolic might cause a lot of metabolic disturbances. And sometimes these patients might have uh, severe hemolysis, which and these hemolysis could be toxic to the kidney. But at the same time, this patient could also have kind of shock because of severe malaria. And that will also impair the perfusion of the kidney. All of this bringing about acute kidney injury. So, but you also, you could also have uh, destruction of, of, of these red blood cells causing hemoglobinuria, all of this causing toxin to the kidney which will bring about uh, uh, acute kidney injury. So these are the kind of mechanisms that make malaria one of the potent uh, uh, cause in acute kidney injury for children. Um, if you're looking at the other causes, this is another study that was published by uh, Professor Sezobo uh, from Lagos. 
And you will see that the causes of acute kidney, kidney injury, again, the sepsis is ranked first there, but you also have malaria, which is also featuring there. But you also have other conditions, including panephritis, and these are native kidney disease that are also contributing to these uh, patients. This is another study from Nigeria, which was published from 2005 by um, um, Professor A.K. and colleagues. And I guess if you look at the picture, here again you see gastroenteritis, which is one of the commonest causes of uh, hypotension and uh, dehydration being ranked as one of the leading causes uh, among these patients that presented with acute kidney injury. But again, you also have conditions like including leukemia, is bucket lymphoma, um, HIV related causes. So I, I guess if you're looking at this picture, you will see the kind of diverse causes uh, of acute kidney injury that can uh, affect children in, in this region. So when you are talking about community pediatric acute kidney injury, again, we, we, when we talk about this, that means we are talking about acute kidney injury that happens before the patients come to the hospital. And of course, I looked at this study that was done in uh, South uh, East Nigeria. It is telling us that um, the prevalence of acute kidney injury at, from the patients that was noted in population was 56%, meaning that when patients are coming to the emergency unit, they have acute kidney injury to the tune of more than 50% of patients that are presenting with acute kidney injury. And these are the patients that have uh, high odds of mortality. They have very high mortality than as compared to those that do not have acute kidney injury. So this is important to take note of. But when we talk about community acquired acute kidney injury, we are talking about snake bite. We are talking about snakes that can cause acute kidney injury. Unfortunately, most of the snakes will happen in the rural setting. And if you are talking about the rural setting, and these are the settings that are underrepresented and most of the big centers, big facilities that are providing services in the region are based in the urban setting. So, and this is one of the reasons that we do not know what is the burden of snake bite associated acute kidney injury. But this is one of the study which was uh, published by Wood et al from South Africa. And they're just showing us that in Northeastern South Africa, these are the clinical characteristics of patients that presented with snake bite. And what is interesting, most of the patients that presented, you will see that these are predominantly children. If you look at the, uh, the upper most, upper left uh, uh, chart, you will see the histogram. You will see that most of these are children that are presenting with this snake bite. And, uh, and, and when you're looking at the children were twofold more likely to get snake bite. And um, the median creatinine in this particular study was 63 micromol per liter. And uh, almost 3.4% had raised serum creatinine of 115, which means we are dealing with acute kidney injury with which is more than probably 5% in this particular patient. This, this study did not look at acute kidney injury per se, but it's just, if you look at this number and the raised serum creatinine, you could extrapolate and say that probably more than 5% of these patients that presented with snake bite might have acute kidney injury as a result of these uh, snakes. And these are snakes that you see here. So. What happens if you get snake bite? These are the mechanisms that happen. You could get direct tubular toxicity, but then you could have hypotension, hemolysis, rhabdomyolysis. You could get DIC as well. All of these will cause acute tubular necrosis. But of course, these toxins act at different places. So you could have thrombosis. You could have um, uh, anti toxin and antivenom. When you're using antivenom, also it can cause acute interstitial nephritis. And you could also get endothelial damage. All of these will bring about uh, uh, acute kidney injury. And of course, if there's no complete recovery, that means you have a risk of going into chronic uh, kidney disease. Um, well, without forgetting, you, we also know that we have this thing. And this is an interesting study that was published from KSMC in, 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 in Tanzania. And this uh, boy was bitten by more than 500 bees and he suffered acute kidney injury. Of course, African bees are very, very uh, aggressive and they really attack in swarms. And of course, if you are bitten by more than, if you are bitten by 
close to 20 bees, you could potentially get multi organ dysfunction. And of course, uh, this acute kidney injury could be attributed to tubular damage, hypotension, hemolysis, and rhabdomyolysis. There's a famous say in Swahili which says that if you want honey, follow the bee. I'm not sure if that is really cold water in this particular case, because you might be following acute kidney injury. So um, not only uh, community acquired uh, uh, acute community acquired cases, but you also have um, trauma, trauma which is also com com contributing to acute kidney injury. We know that with the rapid urbanization in regions, in most of the sub-Saharan cities, particularly, you have a lot of people moving into cities. You have a lot of Auto, automotive, including motorcycles and cars, and with no very good safety precautions in the in the roads. So you we also get a lot of children that are getting uh, that are um, are getting traumatized and they are sustaining severe injury. We are also getting burn injury for road traffic accident, and this is also contributing to uh, acute kidney injury. This is an, a study that was done by Beyond Start, and this is uh, an incidence from Malawian children, Malawian court. And it was noted that nine point, or close to 10% of these children that had trauma, they had acute kidney injury. And mortality was as high as 40% in these children that had acute kidney injury and sustained the injury. And of course, these are the children that were noted to have used the herbal medications prior to presenting to the facility, which is also making it a little bit more complex when you are looking at these particular patients. Um, so, um, if you look at this interesting study, this is a South African pediatric surgical outcome study. It's, it was a 14 days prospective observation court study that was looking at surgical outcome of patients. And interest, interestingly, 0.5% of the patients had acute kidney injury as one of the complications. And these are the patients that had other kind of surgeries. But in this particular region, particularly in the sub-Saharan African region, we are seeing emergence, emergence of open heart surgery and uh, other advanced treatment of, uh, of, of, of cardiac conditions. And um, currently at the moment, we see some heart surgery activity in Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Uganda. Of course, South Africa has, South Africa has well-established um, uh, open heart, heart surgery. So, and, and it is known that cardiac surgery associated acute kidney injury, particularly in children, it ranges between five and 33%. And um, um, it, 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 it's, it's pity that we don't have data to show what is the burden of acute kidney injury. That might be associated to uh, open heart surgery and this kind of treatment. So I'm, I'm, I think that this is just a tip on the iceberg, which is, show, which is showing that we might be having a huge burden of acute kidney injury that might be attributed to these new services that are coming up, which also increases the burden several falls, looking at the community acquired acute kidney injury, and now we are having increasingly a host to acquired acute kidney injury. So uh, this is another study that we did uh, at Mumbil National Hospital. And it is just showing us what is the, it was looking at the neonatal acute kidney injury and uh, among children that had cr critically ill that we are seeing at Mumbil National Hospital. And in this study, uh, 378 patients were recruited and the prevalence of acute kidney injury in these patients was 31.5%. 31.7%, which is close to 32%. And unfortunately, the overall mortality in, in, in the, all these children that had critical illness was 20, around 23%. But if you look at the, 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 if you compare the mortality between those that had acute kidney injury and those did not have acute kidney injury, it is 70%, almost 71% of those that had acute kidney injury died which is showing us that the, the burden of mortality is very, very high. And if you connect this one with the fact that the leading causes of neonatal mortality in the world, literally, and, and of course, when I say in the world, I'm, the biggest chunk of that global mortality, neonatal mortality, contributed by Sub-Saharan Africa, the leading causes are neonatal sepsis, uh, birth asphyxia, and prematurity. And these are the patients that might be presenting with critical illness. So it means that acute kidney injury is contributing significantly to the neonatal mortality in this particular region. So if you look at causes, and this is a, a nice systematic review that we are done by, uh, by Oloweta, and it is showing us that That's if you look at the causes of acute kidney okay. injury, you can see the infection, glomerular diseases, 
you have uh, intravascular volume depletion, and all these are contributing to acute kidney injury. And this can give you a very nice picture of what is the burden of acute kidney and what are the kind of causes that are causing. And I guess this also is giving us a very nice comparison between adults and children, because if you look at this one, you, you can see that the contribution of glomerular diseases in pediatric acute kidney injury is 21% as opposed to 8% in adults. Again, if you look at the uh, sepsis, it's almost similar between adult and children. But again, if you, if you come to congenital abnormalities, the cause, the, the contribution of acute kidney injury is mainly predominantly in pediatrics. When you look at the in, in, intravascular uh, uh, volume depletion, again, they, 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 it's more common in children as opposed to adults, because it is only 5% of adults where it is more, almost 11%, which is showing us that there's a huge burden of acute kidney injury in the region. So what kind of treatment, what are the treatment that are available in Sub-Saharan Africa? So this is an interesting study survey that was published by John Setal, and it is looking at the, it's a survey that was done in SADC. SADC, this is South African Development Countries Region Community, South African Development Community, and these are the countries that are included in the color, you can see them, these are the color, and Nigeria was also included. So Tanzania was noted as one of the countries. Unfortunately, not, not all the uh, people that were in, involved in this survey re reported back. So if you look at Tanzania, what was reported in Tanzania, you will see that we are reported as having only two nephrologists, which might not be true, literally, because we have more than that. But um, what is important in this particular study, look at the availability of services in these centers that were surveyed. You see that it is more, more most of them are less than 50%, you see, and these are uh, tertiary facility. Most of these services are available in tertiary facilities and in university teaching hospitals, which means that the other lower levels of healthcare provisions are not represented. They don't have facilities to support uh, uh, this uh, management of acute kidney injury. This is another study that we published, which is looking at Tanzania uh, and availability of services. And you can see that, um, of course, CRRT is one of the uh, modern uh, modality of managing acute kidney injury. So in Tanzania, in 2009, when we published this study, there are only three machines, CRRT machines. But if you're looking at the distribution of dialysis services in Tanzania, which has close to more than 25 regions, it is only a few regions that are represented, which means that a big chunk of the community is not accessing these services in the in in the in the region and um, this is another interesting study which was uh, conducted by uh, international pediatric nephrology association and they're just looking at the treatment of acute kidney injury in developing and developed countries it is interesting if you compare the developing countries and developed countries you will see that what is what was noted to be uh, accessible throughout was peritoneal dialysis which was uh, available throughout mo most of the facilities that were offered. But if you look at the hemodialysis, CRRT, SLED, these are mostly available in the developed countries. And interesting, the kind of treatment that is offered for children, you will see that in, in, in developed countries, they are looking at CRRT as well as hemodialysis as compared to peritoneal dialysis, which was, uh, which is the main modality of treatment of infants or acute kidney injury. That means we are not using this fans technology, which might be more effective anyhow. But I'm not saying peritoneal dialysis is not effective. It is it's equally effective in treating these children. So when we look at the acute dialysis, which is treatment for patients that need uh, renal replacement therapy, it is the commonest modality across various, across the region of Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, there are several reasons for this. It can be convenient offered when you have limited resources and of course it can be offered by even by non-nephrologists you could also improvise uh, significantly with this technology and uh, of course there's a huge support from these international organs to support uh, provision of uh, dialysis services in the region and uh, the kind of services that are available you could also have uh, hemodialysis services and these are mainly in well developed centers. And when we say well-developed develop, developed centers, these are mainly in the big cities in the region. And you could see them 
uh, with the exception of South Africa, which might have more centers that are well developed. But Kenya, Nigeria, they might be able to provide some form of human health services. Tanzania, of course, in, for bigger children, they can access uh, human health, which is similar to other settings. Uh, but when we look at the continuous uh, therapy like CRRT, this will be only available in South Africa mainly when you are looking at the region. And um, so I would like to talk about Saving Young Lives uh, initiative. So I, I, it, it's interesting to say that this initiative was born in, uh, was initially piloted at Kilimanjaro, which is in Tanzania, and I was born at the foot of this mountain. So it's, it's um, and then this was established 2012. And uh, as uh, initially before this one, this was uh, established as a proof of principle for sustainable acute PD program for limited resource setting. And the first project, which was a pilot, was done in Kilimanjaro. And it was a project pro initiative which was um, partnered uh, by three organizations, which is ISN, IPN, and ISPD. And the fourth one was Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation, which was mainly dealing with supplies, as opposed to the three ones which were offering education and training. And uh, this program, the first, uh, the pilot of this program was, of course, Kajiru Kilonzo was one of the person that was, I would say, one of the champions of this pilot program. And this program involved training of two senior residents, one from internal medicine, the other one from pediatrics, and two nurses. And these were trained for five weeks in Brazil. And uh, so you could see that five-week training all the way, I mean, across the continent to the Brazil, and they were trained for five, day, five, five weeks. And they came back, and the training was in May, and in, in July, the first patient was dialyzed, which shows that even with a very short training, you could start immediately to get the fruits of the investment. And um, this is an interesting uh, study that was published by Kajiru Kilonzo. And of course, the program is saving young lives, but I guess you can see that we have even 54 years old who are uh, older children anyhow. I usually call everybody a child. They will be different that there will be small children and bigger children. So you will see that even adults were also included and they were recipients of this program, which was main, meant for saving young lives. But all the way, all together, it uh, provided services to all the age categories, which is uh, impressive. So uh, this program eventually was uh, scaled up to involve other centers. And these are some of the centers that were noted as of 2016. And you can see several centers that were involved in the program, and uh, which shows that there was a uh, scaling up of the program. However, despite the fact that this program was uh, very successful, but there were challenges that were noted. And some of these was maintenance of the equipment and loss of position after training and institutional support. Of course, you should understand that the program was mainly supporting the initial setting up of the program, but the hospital was supposed to take over the, 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 the program. So sometimes the, the administration will say, yes, we'll continue with it, but they might not really keep the promise that they entered into. And uh, so I would like to just look at the factors that might be uh, favoring PD for acute kidney injury in sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, we also need to say that one of the factors that I noted was relative low cost. I, I do not completely agree that this is a relative low cost. I would say this is perceived lower cost, uh, particularly when you're looking at the equipment and supplies. And of course, the fact that you can improvise conveniently when we are doing uh, using for PD and catheters. And of course, you can train these people very, very conveniently and easy uh, in being them providers of this. But if you look at the, one of these um, um, study that was published by OBI, who, who was comparing, uh, she was comparing the price of doing hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis at our setting at that particular time. You will see that the, the prices for the hemodialysis would be considered to be high as compared to uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis. This might not be entirely correct uh, for all the cases. And uh, again, you, you should also know that you can easily improvise. 
for peritoneal dialysis. And you can use anything for your PD catheter. So there are people that are using nasogastric tubes, intravenous fluid can also be, uh, intravenous giving sets, Foley's catheter, central lines, all these things can be improvised. And you could make your PD fluid at bedside, com combining different things. This is an interesting solution that was developed by Red Cross Children Hospital in South Africa. And they, are, they were using this one initially as one way of making a peritoneal dialysis and to do PD. So, which means that you can, even do PD when you don't have any supplies at that particular moment. But we also have hemodialysis services and there are centers that have reported to do hemodialysis. And this is one in Nigeria. But what is, what is uh, interesting is that most of the children that are getting access to hemodialysis in the region are relatively older children. And you could see that the mean age in this particular case was nine, nine and the mean weight was 626 kilograms. That means these patients are, might be using the supplies for adult patients and, uh, and 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 in this particular study they are also interesting noting that dialysis was relatively cheaper than peritoneal dialysis which is uh, quite interesting and contrasting what Obiagui reported in the same setting of Nigeria but again this might be the case if you are looking at the smaller children and bigger children, because the amount of fluid that you might need for dialysis might be different when you are dealing with smaller children and, and bigger children. And um, this is another study that was uh, done in Cameroon. I know in Nigeria, again, this is looking at the access to renal replacement therapy. And this is also giving us a very nice picture of what is happening. So in this study, children that presented with uh, renal disorders, almost 33% uh, had acute kidney injury and required renal, renal replacement therapy. And only 39, almost 39% were had access to uh, renal replacement therapy, of which 64% uh, uh, had acute kidney injury. And these who had acute kidney injury, those that were younger were, give, were, were provided acute PD, and those that were older were given uh, hemodialysis services. And of course, it is also saddening to see that the reason for getting renal replacement therapy is ability to pay. And if you look on the right side, you will see a nice uh, pie chart that is showing us. If you look at the, uh, the, 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 if you compare the lower chart and the upper chart, you will see that patients that were coming from upper uh, socioeconomic status had even access to chronic hemodialysis services. Not only acute, they could also get access to even chronic dialysis services as compared to those that could not pay. And this is showing how limited access we have for patients that have acute kidney injury in the region. This is another interesting study that was published in Cameroon. And it is also reviewing the chart of patients that received uh, who presented with acute kidney injury. They so close to more than 100 children who were aged between zero and 17. And this is, uh, and unfortunately these patients were cared for by pediatrician and they were getting support from adult uh, nephrologists and they had only hemodialysis. And you could sense that this hemodialysis was run by the adult physicians. So most of the patients that got access to dialysis must have been bigger children. And you could see, if you look at the rights inside on the, on, on the table here, you will see that patients that really got access to dialysis were very uh, few, right? Which is showing that there's really, really limited uh, access. And the reason is lack of funding, which is really sad. So uh, you guys look at what is it that we, what is happening at Mwibil National Hospital? What is it that we are doing? Remember when we started, we, we had a case that I presented to you an 18 month old child. So this child presented to us and we saw this child. We did not have any support at that particular time, but we decided to, to dialyze this child. And what we dialyzed with, we, we dialyzed this child using this stiff uh, piece of pipe there that you can see. And this pipe, we inserted it in this patient's um, uh, peritoneum at bedside and we had to dissect the peritoneum to put this in. And we made PD fluid using IV fluids. And this IV fluid was made using dextrose solutions as well as normal saline and sodium bicarbonate and several other things that were put in for these patients. So luckily for us, this child survived. And this was our first patients that we dialyzed using uh, peritoneal dialysis. And ever since we've been providing uh, dialysis services for peritoneal dialysis services for these children. So we are 
providing renal replacement therapy for pediatric patients that have acute kidney injury. And this is for smaller children. And we are using stiff catheters from India. I believe you know those stiff catheters. Some of you might have seen them. I'm sorry I did not share the, the image here. And we, most of the time, we are using improvised solutions. And these solutions were made at bedside. By now, we've, 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 we've been clever. We are sending it to the pharmacy, and the pharmacists are making this PD for, for us. But for older children, those that are aged nine years and above, we are sending them for hemodialysis. And of course, this is the same kind of practice that you might see across the region if you go to most of the centers in the region. So uh, because of all these uh, uh, case reports and uh, uh, reports of success of uh, peritoneal uh, dialysis that were done using improvisation, uh, there was the, the in the international society made their changed their recommendation to include utilization of improvised equipment for PD catheters and PD fluids as one of the recommendations, despite the limited evidence that we have. And this has been used in the spirit of saving life, although it is not standard of care, and there is limited evidence to support its adoption. So this is an interesting. Um, ISPD guideline update, which was published last year. And you can see clearly they are saying that if you do not have PD catheter, use anything that can, that can, that can give you access to the peritoneum. And this can include nasogastric tube and anything that you can use. And if you want to make PD fluid, then it is easy. You can just use your PD intravenous fluids, use ringers lactate, put in 50% uh, dextrose, and you will be able to make peritoneal dialysis. So this has been a very, very interesting approach, and it has supported uh, services to most of the patients that really need uh, peritoneal dialysis and uh, services for acute kidney injury in resource-limited setting. And um, just to top it up, recently there's a published study which, is, which was conducted at Red Cross Children's Hospital using the improvised peritoneal dialysis. Uh, and these 49 children were dialyzed using acute, uh, using improvised PD that was made at bedside, which could be made at bedside. The only, of course, the difference is the fact that they used the standard PD catheters in this particular case, but they improvised fluid using balsol plus 50% dextrose solution. And the peritonitis, which is the feared complications, was noted in 0.0%, less than 1% of patients that had acute kidney injury. Of course, I must, ask, I must admit that this study was done in a very state of art setting. So, but nonetheless, it is showing that it, it, peritoneal dialysis can be uh, successfully done, even in the setting where we don't have all this equipment, particularly when you are faced with uh, uh, life, uh, life, or, life or death situation. So I would like to allude into a zero by 25 initiative, which was uh, uh, made in uh, 2015. And I'm, I would like to, I'm looking at what does this initiative mean for South Africa? for sub-Saharan Africa, literally. This has been a very good initiative for the region, and it has really addressed important aspect of acute kidney injury, which has made acute kidney injury more visible. And it has, of course, the, the, the downfall of the, the, the initiative is the fact that it has been promoted mainly by the nephrology society and nephrologists. And it has not been really, really accommodated by the uh, national health systems as one would want, what one would wish. And it is a very broad in initiative and uh, with no streamlined goals. The goals were really, really broad and no really tangible measures. There are no things that you could really monitor and say that you could use that. And of course, it's only four years to the 2025 when we, when we come to the end of this initiative. So that being the case, what happens beyond 25? So for that, I'm proposing acute kidney injury, 75, 50, 25 by 35. And my proposal is we should have awareness of acute kidney injury to 70% of the provider, regardless of where they're sitting. Just make sure that they know what is acute kidney injury. Because being educated, being aware of acute kidney injury is good enough. It's enough for somebody to take care and what are the risk factors and which patients might are likely to have this one. And for use all the media that we can use. It could be classroom, included in curriculum, use social media and everything. So the other 50% is we need to provide support for management of acute kidney in 50% of the facilities. This could be in the form of diagnostics. I'm happy that point of care 
testing kits are coming up and probably in the near future, there will be a, re a, a reality. And of course, we also need to think about how do we make supplies for hemodialysis and petroleum dialysis. Of course, it is important to promote the local production of PD fluids. I can assure you that in the block of 1.1 billion people, there is no single center that is producing peritoneal dialysis fluid. So the fluids that we are using here has to come from Germany. So you could imagine how much does it take to transport uh, PD fluid from Germany before it reaches Ghana, because it has to come from Germany, it goes to South Africa, and then it goes to Ghana. So all these are increasing the cost of dialysis services. So I think we need to promote supplies which will be readily available. So my other, the 25, 25 is we need to reduce the mortality due to pre preventable acute kidney injury by 25%. And for this, for, for this to happen, we need to be able to do early identification. And we also need to have early referral to facilities that will be supporting and sub, uh, over offering renal replacement therapy. But for this uh, program to work, it has to be included in the United Nations agenda. All the other programs, all the other uh, initiatives that have happen, including Sustainable Development Goal, Millennium Development Goals. These were called for by United Nations agents. So without active involvement of the, like, of the likes of WHO, UNICEF, and other UN agents, we might not be able to go and have a meaningful impact of this program. That being the case, I'm happy that uh, you have given one hour to listen to my talk. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is excellent presentation, Dr. Francis Soria. And uh, it's a good highlight uh, and overview regarding the acute kidney injury. So uh, it's, it's the time for questions and comments. And um, uh, maybe let me start. Uh, Dr. Francis, uh, you know, when I was um, at Muhimbili, I remember uh, we used to see uh, children uh, uh, the, actually, the, the one that you started with, uh, that uh, on your first slide, um, there was a, a lot of children who had acute kidney injury due to diarrhea and volume depression, and of course, malaria. But later, uh, then with the introduction of a rotavirus uh, vaccine and uh, pre increased preventive measures of malaria, then I, I saw these cases going down significantly. And now, uh, and that was like five years ago or, or more than five years ago. I don't know how is the situation now. Do we still have a lot of patients uh, with AKI due to malaria and uh, diarrhea diseases? Okay, thank you, Dr. Makwabe, for this uh, interesting question. I, I would like to say, first of all, we are still getting um, acute water diarrhea. And of course, the burden has gone down, but we are still seeing these patients. And um, it's true that the vaccine has, uh, uh, to some extent, reduced the burden of uh, acute kidney injury secondary to uh, rotavirus. But also, you also need to remember that there are several different serotypes that are covered by the vaccines. So there are also, but there are also other etiological agents that are contributing to acute to acute water diarrhea, including bacterial causes. So that also is still contributing. And um, the other, when it comes to the malaria and all the initiatives that have been happening, so there, 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 there's, there are two sides. There are still areas that we are still seeing a lot of children that are coming with severe malaria. And because this, uh, we've taken so much measures in reducing the burden of malaria, we have made some of these people that are living in places that don't have high burden of malaria to be less immune to malaria. So when they do get malaria, they get severe form of malaria because they've now lost their, quiet, their immunity that was uh, limiting their malaria. So we are still seeing children with, um, with uh, severe malaria and acute kidney injury in our setting. And uh, so it is still there, but the burden has come down, but there are still other areas that are also uh, getting children that have um, severe malaria and um, acute kidney injury. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francis. Um, any, any other comment or question from the audience? Um, okay. Yes. Dr. Dr. Yes. Bashir, who's put up. Dr. Bashir, yeah. put up his hand. Dr. Bashir? Yes, yes. I, uh, first of all, greetings, Francis, uh, from Kenya. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bashir. Nice to uh, see you. Thank uh, you fantastic for Fantastic presentation. 
yeah 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 thanks thanks so yeah fantastic presentation uh, uh we do a lot of uh, pd uh, acute pd uh, in uh, kenyatta New, uh, national hospital uh, in fact uh, very very busy center and uh, we we when you talk about uh, improvised uh, fluids and stuff i would like to tell you that you know because of covid we had challenges in getting the pd fluid so we had an opportunity to use Hartman solution with dextrose. And uh, we did, we dialyzed around 70, more than 70 kids with uh, acute PD on, uh, with Hartman's and, and dextrose. And you know, we didn't see, the outcomes are fantastic. So mortality was very low. Peritonitis rates were no different from, uh, from the normal PD. And uh, let me, I think really, this is the direction for at least for acute PD, this is, the direction we all need to move because it's, uh, I think really like your idea about beyond. And uh, I, I always say that for us Africans, uh, we need, in third world countries, our solutions will have, have to come from ourselves, not from outside. And we need to start looking into solutions. We need to demystify acute PD and, and acute kidney injury. Like you said, every doctor should know how to do it. Every nurse should know how to do it. Peritoneal dialysis should be as easy as doing, fixing an IV line and starting a drip. We should be able to do it in the smallest centers because you don't really need much to start it. And uh, once we demystify and train, I think we are going to start, we are going to lose very few kids from this condition. Uh, thank you, Francis. Uh, always nice to see you uh, and well done. Keep it up, man. Thank you, Dr. Bashiri. That's really good talking from coming from you that uh, we could use these improvised uh, solutions that uh, people have been uh, fearing uh, that they might be related, uh, they might be causing infection. So I guess this is a re reassuring that people can use these uh, uh, improvised technique safely with the support of uh, international uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, society support. I guess we should be more encouraged to do peritoneal dialysis for these children. Thank you so much for that. All right. Um, there is a, a chat on the chat box. What do you do for children less than nine years or less than 20 kilograms who had PD for AKI but went to CKD and chronic PD program at MNH? This comes from a Krabi, Dr. Krab from KCMC Moshi, Tanzania. Thank, thank you, Dr. Akrabi. I, I guess uh, one of the challenges that we get is the fact that uh, patients that are, that are able to be put in uh, hemodialysis, it has been easy. But then again, when you are putting patients with hemodialysis, you really need to get uh, the, 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 how, how do you get out of hemodialysis because you cannot dialyze them indefinitely. Of course, we are lucky that we've started the kidney transplantation program and we have been able to transplant a nine, year, a nine year old child, which means this, this is um, a potential uh, route for these children that are getting acute kidney which does not recover. But it is a very challenging um, um, area that uh, we need to think about. I, I can tell you that I really don't have good answers. There are times when I'm forced to advocate uh, chronic, uh, conservative chronic kidney care for these patients, particularly when we have limited resources and they don't have enough support to take them to kidney transplantation. So that has been, uh, unfortunately, one of the routes that we use. But for those that have uh, support to put them into uh, kidney transplantation, we are trying to promote that. That is one of the uh, gateway for these patients that will require long-term dialysis and that might need long-term uh, renal replacement therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. The same question, um, another question from Dr. Krabi. Uh, she's asking about, are the indications for dialysis in kids are the same as in adults? Th thank you, Dr. Krabi, almost the same. I usually tell people that the indication for dialysis are almost the same. They don't change between adults and children. They are almost the same, I guess. We, the only difference is the fact that they are, these are bigger children and these are small children. So we just use the same kind of uh, indications. I would not say that they are, they are different between adults and children. All right. Uh, 
so uh, we, I would allow like two or three more questions or comment from the audience. So thank, thank you, Dr. Francis. This is Lloyd. Uh, thank you, Dr. Francis, for the excellent presentation. Phenomenal presentation. You've covered the whole the definition, the causes, neonatal AKI, especially uh, that open heart surgery in Africa. That's something new that you said. Drugs, I, I guess drugs too could produce AKI. Yeah, yes, yes, indeed, uh, Dr. Lloyd. And if you look at the case, the first case that I as a case as a case yeah. that was uh, yeah. presented you will see that yeah. child presented yeah. with um, severe acute malnutrition acute water diarrhea and you were given ampicillin gentamicin so it's a little yeah, bit yeah, difficult to tell whether it is the drugs that were responsible or it is the acute water diarrhea or it is a bacterial infection that the patient had so drugs are also quite common and we are using most of these drugs uh, including non steroidal yeah. inflammatory drugs that are being, being given to children particularly those, those that have sepsis and uh, acute water diarrhea and all this okay so I guess there's one no, question. No, no. Somebody, Stop. 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 I actually yes. went wrong. What I meant was herbal medication. What's the experience? Herbal medication, not not drugs. I meant herbal medications. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Herbal medications is also quite common. The what only I meant was only... herbal medications. Not so. I'm yes. sorry. Uh, I... Yeah, yes, yes, Dr. Still, Lloyd. Uh, I, I, it's a, a, it's a, I made a mistake on the question. Does herbal, do you find herbal medications for Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. I do agree with you that uh, the use of uh, herbal medication is quite common. And uh, one of the one of the challenges that we get with uh, with uh, herbal medication is the fact that when these patients are coming to us, it is difficult to pinpoint what exactly caused the the, the, the acute kidney injury. And invariably, they will, invariably they will come with acute water diarrhea. They will come with sepsis. They will come with severe malaria, and they will have used some of these herbal medications. And of course. Uh, sometimes they might not disclose to us that they've given herbal medication to these children. But I would like to believe that they also contribute significantly because we see that there are patients that are coming in with uh, uh, herbal medication induced acute kidney injury. And of course, sometimes it is also common that even children that are admitted in hospitals, you will see that the relatives are also bringing herbal medication to children that are admitted in the hospital. And they will be secretly administering their herbal medication. So you sometimes you have to be really careful. Sometimes they do develop this acute kidney injury in the ward because they are getting herbal medications while they are continuing with their treatment in the hospital. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Francis. That's a very good answer. So uh, two more chats. Uh, is, it, it, you know, is it necessary that IV antibiotics should be administered uh, before or after PD? Do we use uh, URR to, to uh, assess sufficient clearances of patients who are doing HD? Of course, of course, uh, URR is also used for uh, dialysis adequacy, and there are several formulas that can be used when you are looking at the dialysis adequacy. But then again, you also need to understand that if you're looking at the adequacy of peritoneal dialysis in children, even in adults, you don't just look at the URR, you also look at the other various factors, including the nutritional status, the serum albumin, and the weight of the child, the growth, you know. So these are the other parameters that can be used. Put together, they can give you the status of what is happening with the child as far as uh, dialysis adequacy is concerned, and the growth as well. So these are the other factors that can be. URR is one of the factors that can be used to determine whether the, the, adequate, the child is getting adequate dialysis. Yeah. And there's another question that is asking, what is the obstacle for uh, establishing uh, O? Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure. There's a question that is asking, why aren't we making PD fluid? Of course, I guess one of the factors that we might think about is the fact that we are not even able to, to identify patients that have acute kidney injury. And we, 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 we have not shown to the service care, healthcare providers that PD can be done successful. Maybe as we increase the demand for PD fluids, then we might get uh, clever people that will think about starting uh, to uh, 
pr produce PD uh, PD fluids in the in the region. I believe it, sh it should be quite um, uh, easily uh, produced because we are there are centers that are producing IV fluids. So I I, I want to believe that it can be. Uh, conveniently done in the region. And that will really change the entire picture of provision of PD uh, fluid, uh, PD, ac acute PD as well as chronic PD. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Francis. Do, can we have uh, one more comment or question from the audience? Thank you, Eva. Dr. Gina, can I just yeah, yes. one comment? Yes, please. Yes, Hello. please. Um, Hello. Thank you. It's Dr. Frida. I would like first to thank you, Dr. Francis, for being pioneer of pediatric nephrology in Tanzania. And um, I was very happy also to hear from Dr. Bashir's experience in Kenya. And from what it seems that uh, this improvised uh, PD for children have been able to save life in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, though not many studies have been done or documented, but we know that it has been done underground. Is it maybe the time maybe using our professional associations like pediatric nephrology to write guidelines on how to do proper improvisation of this uh, PD and to advocate this use of improvised uh, peritoneal dialysis, even to the rural settings? because we have experience in most of the urban settings in the national hospital or referral hospital, but I'm sure we are losing a lot of children in the rural settings. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Thank you, Dr. Frida. That's an excellent comment. And I would like to acknowledge the fact that we are using improvised PD fluid for di peritoneal dialysis, particularly for children in Mwanza, which is in Tanzania and KCMC. They are also doing that, and we're also doing that in other regions in the country. So it can it can be done. And again, as we're putting it, International Society of Nephrology, International Pediatric Nephrology Association, and International Society of Petrono Dialysis, they have all given a recommendation, and they have given a guideline which is was updated as uh, uh, last year, which is allowing us to use uh, to use uh, peritoneal dialysis to use improvised fluid for peritoneal dialysis. So I think these guidelines are already put in place. We just need to adopt them locally and make sure that people are aware on what is what need to be done to use these uh, uh, equipment uh, successfully. Thank you, uh, Dr. Francis. Dr. Lloyd, you wanted to comment something. Yeah, uh, the, thank you, Dr. Francis. Wonderful talk, you know, and uh, improvisation is a very, very important uh, issue in the developing world. And, you know, uh, years ago in India, in, in, in the rural setting, you know, we did the same thing. And uh, one thing that we have in India is we have these, as you mentioned, the, those stiff catheters. And those stiff catheters, and actually you can modulate the holes in the stiff catheters. Best just by using your IV needles and make it bigger or so, and cut that tip to make those whole, depending on needles, we could also use it in units, you see, and put it in there. So those are very, very cheap, actually, it just cost the whole big catheter, long catheter, actually costs about $4, even today in India. And I have got those catheters into Rwanda uh, on request. Uh, a few months ago, actually, before the COVID, not months. And through it's already you're already doing it locally. I think it's a it's a great thing to go, you know, on 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 improvisation in in PD because especially in the regional hospitals across Tanzania, it really will play a big role. And you know, we actually have had to go. We did meet these international people to get PD fluid inside, and actually Nick did sign up with the Baxter to supply us uh, PD fluid into Tanzania, but. You see, it's been about over two years and they have not bothered because the, the issue is that their numbers are very little this time. And that has been an issue. Now, the other challenge we've seen across is PD fluid about 15 years ago. We all promoted the company and then we man they manufactured for about three years. On the third year, we suddenly found a whole batch of fungus across the country and then they closed down and they were bought up by Baxter later. So this is the problem with PD fluid. Sometimes if, if the quality is not checked, 
Uh, we also had another company called Jemitra in India, and I'm not sure what has happened to that company now. They were supposed to come into Africa, but somehow I've not heard anything much now. Now, currently, I think again in India, it's only Baxter supplying fluid. So this has been a challenge in terms of uh, Baxter, you know, in terms of PD fluid, long-term sustainability of, you know, uh, uh, maintaining that PD fluid, I mean, the quality of the fluid long term, that has been a challenge. But I think improvisation is a very, very important concept that you've got, and I think that should really be, you know, can easily be carried out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lloyd. Yes. Yes. Do you have any comment regarding what Dr. Lloyd has Somebody commented? was asking, how do you, how do you calculate uh, EGFR in children? I, I would say that the simplest formula is to take the height of the child, height of the child, multiply that by 40 and divide by the serum creatine micromol per liter. You'll get your EGFR. So that's the easiest way of getting the EGFR. And I guess the, somebody else was asking, what is the best way of diagnosing acute kidney injury? Which formula should we use? Is it acute, is it acute, is it rifle or is it KDGO? Of course, KDGO is the latest one, which is combining the other two uh, criteria. And it is, uh, so you can easily use KDGO, but you can use all the other ones. So I would like to thank everyone. Dr. Francis, this was an excellent, excellent presentation and, uh, and the participation was very, very good. We really thank you for your time. And I'd like to thank everyone who participated in this presentation. So I think you have come to an end of a presentation and therefore I'll uh, see you next time. Maybe before we, we, if you have anything to comment before we leave. No, I just want to thank all the participants who took time to join in the talk and the AHN for uh, providing this platform. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Francis. We really appreciate your your presentation and everything that you have put towards this presentation. And thank you for everyone for for participating. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes.